In business today, three things to know. First, will earnings season bring investors a pot of gold? Some are expecting blowout results. We'll see where the rainbow leads. Then, IPOs that crumble, how a cupcake company went broke, and why other fad IPOs fall apart. And it's the school of pot. We'll talk with the CEO of the Cannabis Career Institute. There is one, in fact, more than one school teaching the business of marijuana. A rise exchange starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz. The markets are looking for news, any news at all. Right before earnings season begins, stocks slid for a second straight day on Tuesday for absolutely no reason at all, unless traders had bet on Brazil in the World Cup because that game is not going so well against Germany right now. Investors are anxiously waiting on second quarter earnings news. The major earnings news is only now beginning, with Alcoa reporting after the bell. There are two economic reports worth mentioning today. A report called the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, or JOLTS, showed job openings surged to 4.6 million in May. That's better than what was expected and may mean that the labor market is starting to tighten. But small business optimism pulled back in June. The National Federation of Independent Business Index fell to 95 from 96.6 in May. However, small business owners say they are going ahead with price increases for their products. Can you say inflation? Let's see how the markets finished for the day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average slid by 117 points to 16,906. The S&P 500 down 13 and change to 1963. And the Nasdaq off by 60 to 4391. Some of our top stocks, the nation's largest aluminum producer, Alcoa, kicking off the corporate earnings season with a bang. The company reporting a better than expected profit for the second quarter of 18 cents a share, topping earnings estimates by more than 50 percent. Alcoa also said it earned $138 million at 12 cents a share during the quarter. Alcoa closing at $14.85. That's up 11 cents. Twitter shares fell by more than 8% after the company reported it's making changes in top management positions. Twitter down 282 to 37.41. And U.S. electric car maker Tesla being sued in China for trademark infringement. The car maker began delivering its Model S sedans to Chinese customers in April. Tesla's down 359 to 161. And taking a look at commodities, gold up 310 and oil up a penny to 103.54. Well, should there be nervous anticipations for the second quarter earnings? Joining us now from S&P is Sam Stovall. He is chief equity strategist with S&P Capital IQ. Sam, good afternoon to you. Hello there, Andrew. Uh, Alcoa, blowout numbers. This used to be a bellwether stock. Should we still consider it a bellwether stock? And if so, what does it say about earnings season ahead? Well, I think it's getting the season off to a good start, as you just reported, 12 cents a share versus a loss of 11 cents a share last year uh, is an indication also that the material sector itself is expected to be among the best performers, posting gains of about 12 percent for this quarter, uh, and that the S&P 500 is likely to be up by at least 6.6 percent in terms of earnings for this quarter. And what has been the case over the last several years is that the estimated number has been beaten by the actual number by anywhere from two to four percentage points. So conceivably, we could see earnings up by double digits yeah, this wanna, quarter. Yeah, and we'll dig into that in a moment. Alcoa considered bellwether, of course, because aluminum goes into so many products. So maybe this means that we are selling more cars, for example. Well, selling more cars, uh, homes, uh, you name it, uh, that aluminum is very important. Uh, we had also had a glut on the markets around the globe. So seeing a bit of firming of prices, also an indication that globally economic demand is improving. Okay. Now, we had a pretty dismal first quarter GDP. Uh, is this suggesting that we're going to have a much more robust second quarter GDP, and that is why you're expecting possibly double-digit earnings growth? That's right. Well, we had a minus 2.9 percent in the first quarter, but S&P expectations are for a positive 3.9 in the second quarter. Uh, also seeing consumer spending up almost 3 percent, uh, capital in investment up more than 10 percent, uh, as well as residential construction up more than 12 percent in the second quarter. So I think Wall Street really is, is uh, putting a lot of hope and faith into a rebound second quarter over the the first dismal numbers. Two questions for you. What are the quality of earnings that you're going to be expecting? And the second, 
do you see any um, chances that margins are going to begin getting squeezed because of labor costs? And if labor costs are going up, of course, that might mean inflation. Right. Uh, well, the quality of earnings, uh, obviously, the question is how are revenues expected to do? And uh, S&P Capital IQ forecasters looking for about a 4.1 percent increase in revenues for this quarter versus a shade below 4 percent last quarter and well below 2 percent in the fourth quarter of 2013. And for the rest of this year, our estimates are for slightly above a 4% revenue growth rate. So actually that would imply that while not as good as the historical number of something close to 6%, it's a lot better than what we've been getting. And in terms of profit margins, yeah, there comes a point in which uh, when demand starts to expand, you have to add to your payrolls, etc. And unless you get the balance correct, uh, that could put some pressure on margins. Sam, for investors then, what is the risk here that either A, earnings miss, but B, if they're too good, that the Fed steps in possibly with a more hawkish view. I don't think the Fed would be stepping in at this point. We've gone through this economic expansion since June of 2009 that has been at a half-speed recovery pace. Uh, I don't think the Fed wants to risk uh, slowing down this just new recovery here uh, because right now the, the growth still is very, very low. Inflation remains within their target range. Uh, they know how to fight inflation. They don't know how to fight deflation. And so I think that they'd be more willing to err on the side of letting it run for a little bit longer before they start pulling away the punch bowl. And finally, Sam, uh, sectors that are going to sort of fall behind here. Well, I think that if we do end up getting better economic growth, better earnings growth, et cetera, that it's the more defensive areas, such as utilities, which are trading at three and a half times projected five-year growth rates versus 1.4 for the market as a whole. Telecom, consumer staples, those traditionally defensive areas, I think, will be taking a back seat. Okay. Sam Stovall with S&P Capital IQ. Thank you. You're welcome. President Obama is requesting almost $4 billion from Congress to tighten the southwest border. In recent weeks, the border has been overrun with unaccompanied children from Central America. Now, the president will travel to Texas tomorrow and is being criticized by Democrats and Republicans for not making a special trip to the border to see the situation firsthand. The White House, meantime, is in talks with Texas Governor Rick Perry about, the meeting, about a meeting between the two. Our Washington bureau chief, James Blue, is here in New York with some more details. James, what are they going to spend the $4 billion on? Because can't we just buy Mexico for $4 billion? Well, you know, Mexico might be able to be bought for $4 billion, but the truth is these uh, undocumented children are coming from further in Central America, from El Salvador, from Guatemala, from Nicaragua. So buying Mexico doesn't get you very much. <laughs> What it does get you, it allows uh, the Obama administration to tighten the border. They can provide more services to the young people who show up. Uh, they are going to use more surveillance in trying to track these uh, you know, immigrants as uh, they come. And they're going to try, 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 try to make sure they sort of convince the governments at home either stop the flow or lose your aid. You know, I'm wondering, because we, we jest about it, but it's a very serious situation from Central America and that Mexico's southern border is as porous as our southern border. Is any of this money going to Mexico? Is there anything we can do to help them? It is very clear that some of the money will go to Mexico and go to the Mexican border patrol, specifically in the southern border. The reality is that people are making so much money um, bringing uh, undocumented people from Central America, yeah. from Mexico, into the U.S. So you can close as many holes as you want. They just sort of figure out another way to get around. So last week the president talked about $2 billion. How did this number double in just a week? The number doubled because the Obama administration has really recognized that this is a major problem. Um, it is a political uh, football. And you might recall, President Bush really got hammered politically yep. for the response to Katrina. And so the idea is to put as much money as possible into the border so there can be no real um, mistake 
the Obama administration is handling. And this is really challenging, though, because we're dealing with children here. So you're dealing with very sympathetic people in this case who are now in the border, and the president's hands have been somewhat tied. Because we have gotten some mixed messages as to whether they're going to deport the children, whether they're not going to deport the children, how they're going to get them back over the border. The president's hands have been tied by a law that was pushed by the Democratic Senate and House and signed by President George W. Bush mm -hmm. that requires a actual immigration hearing for every unaccompanied minor mm -hmm. who makes it to the U.S. That takes weeks and months, and that's the reason there's going to be it, such a delay. It's the law of unintended consequences, because clearly the, the peddlers of these children who are bringing them over here probably know about this. you think Congress is going to give the president $4 billion? Uh, the president will get the money, but I think he'll also get a lot of scrutiny um, for people. They just want the situation sorted and solved, but I'm not sure $4 billion is going to really do it. And finally, is the president going to go to the border and... You know, what's the purpose of him really going there other than, like you mentioned, the situation compared it with Katrina and President Bush? Look, this is a humanitarian crisis. There are, you know, young people, women in really, really bad situations. It certainly deserves the president's attention. And since he's going to be in Texas for fundraisers, trying to raise money for his political party, I think everyone agrees that he could probably spend time yeah. looking in on a big national crisis. The optics certainly don't look too good that he's going to, to raise money. Okay. Not at all. All right, James Blue, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, some IPOs crumble like a cookie. What happened to crumbs and how can you tell if your next investment is half-baked? You're watching Arise Exchange. I think news does make people put things in black and white terms just so that they have a dividing line between what their viewers like and dislike. When they like see a person of color, they either think that they're not going to do anything, they're either on drugs or they got pregnant at an early age. And I just want to say that that's not true. It tends to reflect more the interests of the upper income people and the upper income interests. Arise News, every culture, every angle. We have breaking news out of Rio right now. The Brazilian government's fear of rioting has reportedly come true after Brazil's very lopsided loss so far, 5 to nil against Germany in the World Cup semifinals. That game's still going on. Arise News Sports contributor Lance Santos is in Rio with the latest. And uh, Lance, what we understand is we're hearing that there is shooting going on as well. Well, yeah, we were uh, sat watching the game on the second screen of the Fan Fest on Copacabana Beach when uh, all of a sudden the crowd started trampling each other and obviously not being able to speak Portuguese. We didn't know what was going on. We tried to pick up a bag, but we had to leave it and run, and, and, and the people were telling us that, that, that there were people shooting. Uh, then we heard what we thought were fireworks, but obviously now we can we can look back and know that they were gunshots. Now, whether it was somebody shooting at the crowd or whether it was people shooting at each other, maybe gangs shooting at each other, we still don't know. We've, we've run down to a uh, British hostel and sort of locked ourselves in. The police, the riot police came in, uh, you know, very heavily armed. They were pointing people to run in the right direction. There were thousands of people running to a street, which police were showing us where to run. Uh, even when we got down those streets, there were cars driving past and everybody started to run again to more loud bangs. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of chaos. There's helicopters flying above Rio right now. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, people, it's a sad scene. You know, people sure. don't have been able to watch the game. Lance how, Lance, how widespread, you know, do you think these riots are? Is it just a, just a few people causing these troubles? Or do you think it's much more uh, larger than that? No, and is it directly uh, related to the game? It's directly related to the game. And I think also... Uh, you know, the tense atmosphere before before the game, people weren't happy with the World Cup being here. Yep. Uh, you know, they wanted, you wanted their government. It was almost as if their government was having a party and not inviting them. And I think these, these fears and these emotions were held on while Brazil was doing well. And now that I think Germany's, uh, Brazil is being humiliated, I think all this anger has come out to the top. And, and sadly, it's resulted in some gunfire, alleged gunfire, at the beach, uh, you know, where people, thousands and thousands of people have gathered children, uh, mums. We were sat next to a mum with four children who I'm not even sure if she managed to get her children because everyone ran. And I think, uh, you know, even beyond the gunshots was, was people, if you fell over, you would just simply get trampled 
by these thousands of people running behind and, you. And Lance, it Lance, was the fear of oh. people's faces that was, that was the scariest. One last question, Lance. Is there any evidence that's going on inside the stadium at all? No, the stadium's in Belo Horizonte, so it's a, it's a few hours away from Rio. Uh, all I can tell you that in Rio, there's certainly going to be chaos on the streets tonight. There is a very heavily armed police presence. Military's been brought in. There's helicopters overhead. And uh, I think Rio's in for a very, very long night tonight. Okay, Lance Santos, Arise News sports contributor. Thank you so much. And Debbie Turner-Bell on Arise America will have more on this coming up later this evening. Turning to some other stories we're following here on Arise, the Northeast Cupcake retailer Crumbs Bake Shop has sold its last red velvet cupcake. Crumbs closed all 65 stores in 12 states this week. The company had gone public in 2011, and it's just one example of a fad company that went public and then either failed or watched its shares crumble. So what are the dangers of investing in these types of stocks? Market Watch contributor and Scudify.com CEO Cody Willard is back here on Arise Exchange by phone, joining us from New Mexico. Good afternoon, Cody. Cody? Is Cody there? Cody, are you on the line? All right, we will uh, come back to Cody. So let's uh, continue. And let's take a look at some of our top business stories making headlines across the nation right now. Some Swiss banks are threatening to freeze American clients' accounts unless they can prove that they pay their taxes. The move comes ahead of a deadline at the end of July as part of a program launched by the U.S. Department of Justice to show which American clients comply with U.S. tax requirements. In May, U.S. regulators forced Credit Suisse to pay a more than $2.5 billion fine for helping clients evade American taxes. Looks like the Panama Canal will be getting some old-fashioned canal competition. Nicaragua has approved a route for a new canal to link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The shipping channel will stretch 172 miles across the Central American country. That's more than three times as long as the Panama Canal built a century ago. Chinese telecom tycoon Wang Ying is behind the project, estimated to cost $40 billion and scheduled to be completed by 2020. The Wall Street Journal may not be the first place you think of a superstar singer, Taylor Swift, voicing her opinion, but that's just what she did. In an op-ed, last year's highest-earning pop star made some insightful observations about the music industry in the era of social media. For example, she wrote, quote, I haven't been asked for an autograph since the invention of the iPhone. The only memento kids want these days is a selfie. Another theme I see fading into the gray is genre distinction. These days, nothing great you hear on the radio seems to come from just one musical influence. And in the future, artists will get record deals because they have fans, not the other way around. Taylor Swift. All right, we have Cody Willard now on the phone from New Mexico talking about failed fad IPOs and crumbs. Cody? Yes, hi. Hi, right, good afternoon to you. So what happened with crumbs here? Did the cupcakes just suck? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this was a strange IPO from the beginning. It's not, it wasn't just a straightforward where a private company had gone out and raised money by selling shares through a broker like Goldman Sachs or something. This was sort of a nuanced, weird kind of thing where they had sold their company to some other investors, and those guys ended up selling shares in the public market to take the market, this company public. Yeah, it's, but to it's, answer your question, yes, the company <laughs> trend died on them, and they could, were not managing their finances well enough to handle it. Boy, Cole, you brought up an interesting point. These, uh, these deals are sometimes called reverse mergers. And it's a way for companies to go public without all of the regulatory filings, including all of the disclosures. Uh, and so the question comes down to uh, how investors should know that these companies exist and whether they should be extra careful when investing in reverse merger companies. Not that they're all bad, but sometimes right. you don't get all the right. information. Well, and that's, it should be a yellow flag. As soon as you see the term reverse merger, I do more homework. It's, it, there's a lot of seediness on Wall Street that goes around those reverse mergers, and you don't want to be the mark at the table in that case. So if you hear the term or you know that a stock came public or has ever been involved with a reverse merger, it's a yellow flag for sure. You should double down on your homework, if nothing else. And then another thing is stick with some of the larger cap companies. This was a small cap, rather, you know, it came public at a small price. It came public at a small valuation. And if it doesn't have a multi-billion dollar valuation out there, 
in doing billions of dollars in sales, of course that's riskier than something that's bigger and been around for a while. And here's the deal. One trick ponies have a problem when the trick runs out. Uh, nothing better than King Digital, which makes Candy Crush as an example. Still a public company, still in business, but has pretty much one product. Ouch, that is a tough draw, parallel to draw there from crumbs to king. I do think King is, a, you know, like I was saying, it is a bigger cap company. I actually just on the Scudify network today gave it a sentiment view of bearish because I agree with you. It's a one-trick pony, and I certainly wouldn't want to own that stock. I don't know that it's going to zero anytime soon, mainly because I do think management is doing a better job of handling their finances than the crumbs people ever did. You know, some stocks. Yeah, <laughs> some stocks that did okay. go to zero, of course, during the okay. internet bubble. If we remember Cosmo uh, was delivering DVDs, but that was a good business. DVDs, Pets.com, <laughs> uh, Webvan, of course, one of the biggest flameouts in history. But there are some survivors where, if you let the IPO go a little while, you could do well. Facebook might be an example of that. You know, I bought Facebook after that after it crashed after that IPO because I thought they did such a phenomenal job of raising as much money as possible on their IPO, and I actually loved it when the stock went down, and I was able to become a long-term shareholder. And, yes, I plan to own Facebook for many years from here. Okay, Cody Willard, thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Coming up, a judge that tells it to the court makes him our favorite person of the day. You're watching a Rise Exchange. Well, Arise is the only network that really covers uh, comprehensively the African diaspora. It gives people in other parts of the world of color a chance to know about people here in the United States, us to know about them, and the world to know about us. So it's kind of an educational experience for everybody involved. Getting to know people through stories, through personal stories, they really get a chance to know what people are actually all about, what communities are about. How are we different? But more importantly, what commonalities we all share. One of the great things about Arise News, it is truly a multicultural global channel that is paying attention to communities of all different kinds, not just here in the United States, not just in Africa, but all around the world. As we're giving a voice to the people that don't traditionally have the kind of a voice that a mass media organization can have. You're getting here at Arise News that you're not going to find at the other networks is a unique perspective. And I think that's part of what Arise is here to do. Pull up to the bar, we have a sleeping Yankee fan for liquid lunch, things that make us want to drink. A guy named Andrew Rector is suing the Yankees and ESPN for $10 million, claiming that one of the TV announcers defamed him when they mocked him for falling asleep during a game. We have the video here, so you tell us what you think. Rector admits that he briefly fell asleep during a game between the Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, but that announcer Dan Shulman went way too far in mocking him. He claims that Shulman said Rector is, quote, not worthy of being a Yankee fan and is, quote, a fatty cow that needs two seats at all time and represents a symbol of failure. Now, ESPN says those words were never used and that the claim is without merit. And by the way, because he's suing, everybody is showing that video again. <laughs> Rector, a used car salesman, says he suffered substantial injury, had his character and reputation damaged, and has experienced mental anguish. Try being a Mets fan. <laughs> and that takes us to our favorite person of the day, when we choose one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. The Supreme Court, you know, usually gets the last word on weighty legal issues, right until a federal judge in Nebraska decided to give his own opinion of the Supreme Court. Judge Richard Kopp, who is the senior district federal judge in Nebraska, wrote on his personal blog that the U.S. Supreme Court should, quote, S-T-F-U. I'll let you translate what <laughs> S-T-F-U means. But basically, it's an impolite way of telling the court to shut up. It's not the first time Judge Kopp wrote opinions in the not-so-legal kind. In March, he wrote a post titled, On Being a Dirty Old Man and How Young Women Lawyers Dress. <laughs> and he once wrote that Congress should go to hell. Nice. Federal judges have lifetime appointments, and it's just about any, impossible to kick them off the bench. Judge Kopp says he received a note from a lawyer he respects, asking him to please stop blogging. He has agreed to do so for now.
And so Judge Richard Kopp, who what many might see as being out of order, is our favorite person of the day. Coming up next, reading, writing, and weed. Getting your degree in the pot business. You're watching a Rise Exchange. I think news does make people put things in black and white terms just so that they have a dividing line between what their viewers like and dislike. When they like see a person of color, they either think that they're not going to do anything, they're either on drugs or they got pregnant at an early age. And I just want to say that that's not true. It tends to reflect more the interests of the upper income people and the upper income interests. Arise News, every culture, every angle. The marijuana industry in the U.S. is smoking hot. That's because there are currently 20 states with legal medical marijuana. Colorado and Washington have both legalized recreational marijuana, and about a dozen other states are expected to legalize pot in some form in the coming years. The industry could see an estimated $8 billion in sales by 2018. Robert Culkin, CEO of the Cannabis Career Institute, joins us from Los Angeles to tell us more about the business of marijuana. Robert, welcome to Arise Exchange. Hey, it's great to be here. What is the Cannabis Career Institute? Let's start there. Well, it is a portal, a gateway to the marijuana industry for those people who are trying to figure out how to get a job, how to make money, how to create their own business, how to figure out the, the whole tangled network of getting into the cannabis industry. Okay, so let's walk through that a little bit. What do people need to learn if they're going to become pot dealers? And not the kind well, on the first street of all, corners. Right, this is a legitimate, completely legal industry now that anybody can get into, even your grandmother. So we have to be able to train people and have standards and have ways that they can learn how to be compliant and know that they are following the law you know, uh, let me completely. Ask, so, yeah, let me ask you about standards for a moment because that has been one of the controversies here because what goes into marijuana is very important, like any substance, and it's largely still unregulated. Are you helping to create an industry standard so customers will feel comfortable that when they buy pot, they are getting pot? Well, right now, since uh, marijuana is federally illegal, we are really concentrating on, on policing ourselves. So the self-policing aspect of the industry has gotten to the point where we're almost doing more than we need to do or, or that we would be asked to do if the FDA or the government was somehow involved. So yeah, I want to ask you. We're labeling. Go ahead. We're labeling, we're testing, we're, we're, we're very conscious of any kind of contaminants or any uh, potential liabilities. Yeah, when you, uh, you know, teach people in these courses, uh, you, do you tell them that it's still a Schedule A drug under federal law, and while currently this administration is not prosecuting, that risk does exist? That is one of the primary focuses of our legal aspect of our classes. We, we have a, an attorney explain federal law, which, as you said, means none of this is legal. Not even having one plan or one joint is legal as far as the federal law goes. So understanding the difference between uh, state and federal law, first of all, and then realizing that if you stay within state law, you're probably not going to be coming into conflict with federal law now. I, w I have to imagine that it is not necessarily a road to uh, a lot of wealth necessarily. There's a lot of competition here. Who are the types of people who are walking in the door who want to do this? I think it, it crosses the entire spectrum. We have uh, three different groups of people who come to our classes. The first is the average Joe that just wants to get a job as a bud tender or a, a trimmer or a grow master. And then there's the investor or the entrepreneur who's coming to the class that wants to start a dispensary, a grow operation, and some kind of a, a marijuana brand. And then you'll have the third group, which are professionals who realize that this is a whole new industry that's going to bring them a whole bunch of new clients. So doctors, lawyers, insurance people, electricians, real estate people, they all want to go green and become green electricians and green uh, plumbers and serve uh, the cannabis industry, but they need to know how do I communicate with uh, these folks, what's the lingo, what are their needs, and that's why those people are We only have about class. 30 seconds left, but can you give me a brief summary of something called Weed Stock, one of the many seminars that have been taking place? 
Well, I was just made a CEO of a publicly traded company called Green Cures, and Weedstock is a convention or an expo for all of the CEOs and all the people who are interested in marijuana stocks. They get together and they talk about uh, how to perpetuate the industry and make everything better, more standards, uh, and create financial opportunities for everybody. Okay, Robert Culkin, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you at the end of the summer and see how things are going. Some more states may legalize marijuana. And Friday on Exchange, Overstock CEO Patrick Byrne stops by to tell us about the changing face of the online commerce industry and why competition is just getting tougher. Let's take a look at the markets. Dow Jones Industrial Average sliding about 117 points. Ahead of that Alcoa earnings report, though, it, that will be interesting to see how the market reacts tomorrow because the report came in much better than expected, and we'll, we'll have more on earnings news. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching the Rise Exchange. See you tomorrow.